So uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Thursday session of String Phenomenology 2020. Uh, before we start, uh, let me repeat to leave your uh, microphones on mute. And if you have a question, the best way to ask a question is to uh, enter it in the uh, chat box. And I'll look at that and I'll call on you to uh, then uh, unmute and uh, ask a question. Or if it's something short, I may just uh, ask it from the uh, chat box. So uh, there, are, there are other ways, but that's the way that I, I will notice most quickly. And uh, with that, uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Fabian Rula here to tell us about uh, knot theory and machine learning. Fabian. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Thanks to Jim and the other organizers for inviting me. I'll share my screen now. All right, does that work for you? Okay, so I want to talk about a project which has to do with knot theory and machine learning, and it's done in collaboration with Sergey Gukov from Caltech, Jim Jodosikowski from Caltech, and uh, also, and we hope it will come out this month or maybe next month. Part of the reviews I will be having for machine learning can be found in this physics report I published end of last year, beginning of this year, but mainly the focus will be on this paper. So let me start with the motivation. Why do we care about knot theory? Well, knot theory is important in physics. There was, of course, Witten's paper in 89, where he related knot theory to uh, transignment theory. Then there have been papers where we found knot theory to occur as a monotomies of links in uh, as CFTs. More recently, Piotr, one of our collaborators and others, put forward this knot gripper correspondence where they found that quantities of the knot, so there's a dictionary between quantities of a knot and quantities of a quiver. But there are also many other examples which go beyond physics. And so of course there's mathematics, and especially in mathematics, there is the generalized smooth Poincare conjecture. And this asks whether every four manifold that is homotopy equivalent to a four sphere is actually diffeomorphic to the standard sphere. And this has been answered in all kinds of dimensions, but sort of the 4D case is the one that still sticks out. And it's sort of Julius here um, had a candidate or had a construct an infinite family of candidates to be exotic spheres, which would sort of be count examples to this in the 70s but then it was proven much, much later, in fact, rather recently, that then these are not count examples. So up to date, this is unanswered and it's very closely related to knot theory. And then it also features, for example, in biology where you can knot proteins or fold proteins and depending on how they are knotted or folded and the molecule or the protein does, does, does a different thing. So it's, it's important to understand this in, in biology as well. So this is my motivation for looking at not theory. This is the outline of my talk. I have um, three parts. In the first part, I will introduce not theory because I do not assume that everybody is necessarily familiar with it. Um, this will be actually a large part of my talk. And then I have two more parts. In the first part, or in the second part, I will discuss machine learning and natural language processing, which means I will first give a one slide introduction to supervised machine learning and to neural networks. And then the reason why I'm talking about this is because we want to phrase a knot theory in terms of a natural language question. And then finally, we apply two tools. One is the, called the reformer neural network. This is the state of the art in language processing in the machine learning community at the moment. And we also apply reinforcement learning in order to answer a question you can ask a knot theory, which is the so-called unknot problem. Okay, let's start with the introduction to knot theory. So the unknot problem, which is sort of the topic I want to address in this talk is simply asking the question, is a given knot the unknot? Meaning, given a knot like this, which is sort of an embedding of a circle into, into three-dimensional space, is this the unknot? Well, and in this case, as it turns out, you can actually perform a series of moves that are not set. So in this case, it actually is the unknot. But of course, the question remains in more general cases. And as it turns out, um, you can answer this question. 
it's a decision problem. Is it not? Yes, no. But it's very, very hard and takes exponentially long. And this can be quantified, how hard this it can be quantified using uh, complexity theory. So there are different complexity classes. And the simplest decision problems are here in P, which means it takes a polynomial time in the input length in order to decide or in order to give a yes, no answer. The harder problems are here in NP, which means that computing the answer or finding the answer takes exponentially long or at least longer than polynomial time. But you can check very quickly that, that if somebody claims this is true, then you can check that this is indeed true. So you can check the yes answers. And then, of course, there are even harder ones. There's NP hard problems. And so these are at least as hard as any NP problem. So it takes at least exponentially long. And then there are NP complete problems, which are NP hard and at the same time in NP. And what this means is that NP complete means that if you can solve any problem, any NP complete problem, you can solve any problem in NP because there exists a map from any problem in NP onto this NP complete problem. So then you could map it in polynomial time onto here, solve it here, and then sort of have a solution for any NP problems. So the chance that NP complete problems are actually in P are very slim because most people actually believe that all of these complexity classes are different. Co and P are problems that are where you can verify the no instances, where as in NP you can verify the, the yes instances correctly. And so the asking whether or not is the unknown has been proven to be in NP in 99. So we know it's somewhere in this in this blob here. And more recently, Cooper Berg in 2014 actually showed that it's in co and P assuming the generalized Poincare conjecture. And more recently, Mark Lackenby from Oxford actually proved it without any extra assumptions. So we know that um, it's in NP and it's in co NP. So the yes and the no, no instances are sort of hard to verify in, in some sense. So it's lying in here. Well, but so this is kind of good news because um, if it's in NP and in co NP, it's most likely not NP complete. Because if it was NP complete, this would mean then that it would also sort of that NP and co NP would actually be the same thing. And most people believe it's not. They believe it's different things. So probably it's not NP complete. So it doesn't belong to this very, very hard blob here. So probably it belongs somewhere in here, truly in here, um, which is good news. Because there, there have been in the past, there have been problems where people thought it was NP and then they found out it's actually they do exist polynomial time algorithms. One example is um, checking whether a number is a prime number. This can actually be solved in polynomial time. So it's figured out in 2002. And then there's, you can sort of factor an integer, which at least you can solve fast on a quantum computer. So this is in BQP. So if this was also true for the other problem, we could maybe find an algorithm that solves it quickly, or we could use an wait for quantum computers and then solve it quickly once you have that. So that's a bit encouraging. However, there's also a theorem which says, well, unless P is not equal to NP, which we don't assume, then there also do exist problems that are generally neither NP nor NP complete. So it could just be that even though it's not NP complete, there is no algorithm in P that solves it quickly. And um, in fact, two years ago, people noticed that deciding whether or not can be unordered in K moves is NP hard. So if you sort of don't ask the simple question whether it is an R0, but ask a more complicated question, can I reach the R0 in K steps, then you all of a sudden go back in here. So maybe it's not so easy. But time will tell. At the moment, we don't know. But there is development even in, in recent years going on in these questions. OK, so if you want to address the R0 problem, we need some way of telling whether two nodes are equal. So for example, this one we saw can be unordered. Whereas this one can. This is the sort of the trivial knot called the trefoil, and this is not the unknown. And so sort of typically what mathematicians do is they come up with invariants. In this case, they're called not invariants. And one important invariant is the Alexander polynomial. In our normalization, if you compute the Alexander polynomial for an unknown, you just get a one, so it's just a constant. However, the converse is not true. So it might be that there are knots which are not the unknown, but still have an Alexander polynomial of one, or let's say there are. The advantages of this is it can be computed quick, very quickly. So it doesn't solve the other problem because the converse is not true, but at least it's, it's, it's a necessary condition for something to not be the unknown. Then there's the Jones polynomial. Again, this is one for the unknown. 
In this case, it's not known whether the converse is true or not. So there's the question of whether there can exist knots which are non-trivial but still have a Jones polynomial form. And earlier this year, um, it was actually checked up to 24 crossings that all knots which are non-trivial also have a non-trivial Jones polynomial. There are more advanced techniques like knot Fleur homology or Kovanov homology, which you can actually use to detect the unknot. But again, these cannot be computed fast. So um, again, this would mean you have to go through some NP or some slow computation in order to check whether or not something is the unknot. Okay, so how do we represent knots in a more trackable way? In the end, you want to use machine learning, so how do we parameterize them? So let's look at this simple trefoil knot again. And first thing we do is we draw it in two dimensions, like this. And now we cut it open. Let's say we cut it into two strands here and here. And we get to something that's called a braid and looks like this. So I cut it open and then I start at these two strands, the orange and the purple one. And now I follow the orange and the purple strand. And at this crossing here, the orange goes over the purple. And then I follow it further on, and then the orange goes under the purple and then goes over the purple again. So I then write down uh, the braid generator sigma one, which braids the first strand and the second strand, the first over the second. And this means then that this knot here would correspond to the braid root sigma one, sigma one, sigma one. And Alex, actually, Alexander showed that all braid, all knots, or all links can be represented in terms of braids like this. In fact, a braids form a group. It's called a braid group. Most properties of the group are straightforward. Just sort of the inverse means that if you take, so sigma one was taking strand one over strand two, and the inverse is just taking strand one under strand two, because if you do that, and you remember that you actually cut it open here, so actually we're looking at the knot, which is the closure, you will see that if you sort of pull this over that, you could just return to the to two, to two unlinks. Or in this case, sort of, if you don't consider closure just in the braid group, you would find that you get like this identity here. And group compositions, you just sort of adding the braids together, concatenating them. There are some equivalents on these braids. So first of all, some braids, braid generators do commute. So if I have, let's say, four strands, sigma one puts the first over the second, sigma two puts the second over the third, and sigma three puts the third over the fourth. So if I now have two strands where the, or two generators that mix strands that don't talk to each other, I can commute these two. So whether I sort of put these two over here and then over there, sorry, and then over there or whether I do it the other way around doesn't matter. So as long as I take strands that, that are not sort of these operators operate in different strands, they commute. So if sigma i and sigma j is more than one apart, I can just commute them. There's one braid relation, the other braid relation, is nicely summarized uh, in a relief here. You can find this on the Simon Sand, in Simon Sand on the fourth floor. I don't know who made it, maybe Mike knows. But the idea is if you have um, these three strands, I can take sort of the middle strand and push it here from the left over to the right. And this is, is, is still the same, same braid. Or written in terms of braids, I can now put, write this from left to right. And I take this blue strand, which is up here, and I, I push it down here. And that means that, for example, sigma i, sigma i plus one, sigma i equals sigma i plus one, sigma i, sigma i plus one. So, so my braids are defined up to this commutation of, of generators that are far enough apart and up to this, these identities. These are equivalences of braids, but in the end, we're not interested in braids, we're interested in knots. So, and knots live in the closure of the braid. Remember, we cut it open, but we are really just interested sort of in identifying this point at that point, and this point at that point. So let's look at the closure of the braids. And um, then there, there are two things you can do to the braid, which changes the braid, but that do not, does not change the knot. So if, if I draw the, the braid like this, this means it was closed and I cut it open here. But of course, I could equally well have just cut it open there, which then would mean instead of doing sigma 1 first, I do sigma 2, then sigma 1, sigma 2, I go around and then do sigma 1. So I'm taking this generator sigma one and I'm placing it over here. And in terms of braids, what this means is I multiply this sigma one inverse here and sigma one here. So there's a braid there's this Markov move which sends a braid root w to sigma inverse w sigma. 
second Markov move is called stabilization. What you're doing there is sort of you take some braid and you pull it up down here a little bit and then you twist it to make a loop. And now if I write this as a braid, it would just look like this. So what I did now is I weaved in an extra strand. So I send braid with W to W times some new generator sigma n plus one. And again, this changes the knot. So this changes the braid, but it doesn't change the knot because I can really just take this loop and shrink it back down to nothing. So these are sort of ways I can mani manipulate my braid without changing the knot. Okay, this, uh, this concludes my review. And now I come to the second part where I want to talk about machine learning and natural language processing. So as it turns out, natural language processing is a very big field of machine learning, mainly due to personal assistance. So if you ask Siri to do something, it's important that they understand what you want them to do. So for example, it has been noticed that if you teach natural language to a machine or to, to a network, it learns semantics and it learns grammar. So in order to feed language to a, your network, you need to embed it in some uh, vector space, let's say r to the n. So each word corresponds to a vector in r to the n. And then after training the neural network, it shows an embedding where, for example, king minus queen is equal to man minus woman in terms of, uh, in terms of vectors. So meaning that it has learned that you take a king, you subtract man, you add woman, you get a queen. This is the idea. It also learns grammar. So walking minus walked is the same as swimming minus swam. And it learns sort of that Spain is to Madrid what uh, Germany is for Berlin and, and so on. So it learns, it learns these semantics and it learns, learns the grammar. Good, so we want to tackle the ANOT with uh, supervised machine learning. And here's my one side overview of what that means. So the task in supervised machine learning is to learn from label data in order to make predictions. Label data just means you have some input output pairs, some feature vector X and some label vector Y. And then we feed X into the neural network or the machine learning algorithm in general, and it should predict Y. So it should learn the map from X to Y for all these pairs. So what we do in practice is we take our label data, we divide it into a training set and a test set. Then we only use the training set to train our neural network or whatever machine learning algorithm we have to learn this map from X to Y. And once we think it has learned everything it could from this training set, we check how it performs on data it has never seen. So this is why we kept this test set at the back of our hands. So there we know the answer, we know the labels, but the machine has never seen it. So we feed it, so that we feed the X to the, machine learning algorithm and see whether it predicts the correct Ys. And if it does to high enough accuracy, we're happy and we think that this thing learned the map such that it can now be used to, to classify or to regress on data points it hasn't seen before. So neural networks, one slide introduction. For us, uh, neural networks are just consecutive applications of affine maps and nonlinear functions. So they are often drawn like this. So you have some input here, you perform an affine map, meaning you multiply by a matrix and you add a constant vector. And then, so you map, use this to map R to the N affinely to R to the M. And then you take some nonlinearity, apply it to, to, to every point in, in R to the M, and then you map it to the, to the next R to the P and so on. And you need to apply nonlinearity because affine maps are closed under composition, meaning if you didn't put a nonlinearity here, you could, so if there's no benefit of doing this at all, you could just write this as one matrix multiplication going from one to three directly. Which type of nonlinearity is a science in it by itself? So you can put something like a piecewise linear function, or you can put something like a sigmoid function or something that involves a tangent. And there are many different choices, but as long as it's nonlinear, adding this layer actually makes it non-trivial. So now when we train a neural network, what we do is um, we have this map from, so from here to there, and the parameters of the neural network or of this map are just the parameter coefficients in W and in B. And during training, we change this parameter such that the function from R to the N to R to the M is actually the function we wanted to learn to map X to Y. It turns out you can always do this in the sense that neural networks are infinitely expressive. 
meaning they can actually learn any function, at least in the infinite width limit where you make this intermediate layer infinitely large. This might not be the best architecture and instead of making this infinitely large, you might want to make it deeper and so on. But in principle, this can learn any function, so it can learn this map from x to one. Good. So how do we feed not to neural networks? As I said, they expect the vector in R to the n. Well, of course, we use braid words, otherwise I wouldn't have gone to the tendons of explaining how to what they are. So if you have a braid word like this, there's one way of converting it to just a vector in R to the n. We just sort of take sigma one, assign it a one, sigma two inverse, assign it a two, and so on. And then maybe we divide by the largest integer such that the numbers don't get too big in here. This has the advantage that sort of sigma one is mapped to one, sigma one inverse is mapped to minus one, so they and they are inverses in here, and they are also inverses in the group of integers under addition. So you have sort of already some structure in this in this encoding. However, the embedding is just one dimensional, and the neural network cannot learn a representation that is easy to process for it. So it might be that when it learns something like this, it learns an embedding, and if we sort of take them choose the embedding for it, it might sort of have to do something less. That's convenient for, for the network. The second possibility is that, that we just let it learn an embedding, which means that it's more flexible to do that, but it has to learn sort of that sigma one and sigma one inverse are actually also are considered inverses. So let's say for the braid group, there's already some, some nice structure here. So actually we don't see a big advantage, disadvantage in, in just doing this rather than letting the neural network learn the structure, but there are other representations, for example, Gauss codes or DAO commutations, which also sort of encode the not, but in this case, sort of, there's not this, this structure of inverses or so. Um, so in these cases, it's more beneficial to use a learnable embedding. So we found, for example, for, for, DAO, for the DAO case that the performance is slightly worse than for braids, and we used an embedding layer there. Okay, so now neural networks can learn semantics and they can learn grammar. So what are the grammar and the semantics of knots? Well, as, an, as a natural language, sometimes you can commute words. He sometimes right, and sometimes it's sometimes he's right. Meaning that also in here you can commute sigma one and sigma three if they are more than one apart. In some cases, however, this, the order does matter. The scientist eats the chicken. It's not the same thing as the chicken eats the scientist. And so, so it learns that some things are not commuting. And there are sort of semantics or equivalences. The scientist reads the, or read the papers the same as the paper was read by the scientist. So I insert this extra word and change some order, which does this, which is precise this conjugation and this stabilization move, and it remains the same. So sort of based on this analogy with natural languages, we were hopeful that the neural network can actually learn these things. OK, let me now come to the, uh, the third part of my talk where we now actually apply these machine learning techniques. And so sort of what we do is we first try supervised machine learning using a reformer neural network to, uh, to learn this semantics. And then in the end, we use it to classify whether or not a given braid corresponds to the or not. So the idea is we feed in this braid word. We choose an embedding layer that embeds it into, well, in this case, R to the 100. Then we use something that's called an extra causal embedding which tells uh, the neural network in which order it read the generators, because sometimes they don't commute. So the, it's actually important for the neural network to have the information of where the generators in the braid world were. This is done here. And after that, we just pipe it through several reformer modules. What, what this does is sort of it, it hashes or groups together similar, uh, similar vectors or similar braid generators as mapped to on, under this embedding. Then it, uh, learns which ones are important in order to, to do the next step. So when you parse a sentence, for example, you need to look at context words, the words that are important for, for this, and other parts of the sentence are not important. So it's learning how to pay attention to, to important parts, or which, which parts are important in order to understand what this, what this great word is encoding. We do this several times, and then we just use one fully connected layer, and then we map it to, uh, to zero or one, with uh, zero meaning false, so it's not the unknown, and one meaning yes, it is the unknown. OK, this is just a sub summary of what I just said. So since we don't want to do um, supervised machine learning, we need to generate training data. And we do this for different braid lengths. So for braid lengths 12, 24, 36, 48, we generate 12,000 knots, 12,000 unknots, and then split it 
90% into the train set and 10% into the test set to see how well our neural network performs. Um, when you do this, when you generate this data, you have to be careful because um, the neural network might outsmart you in the sense that it learns some, syst some systematics you use to construct this. It doesn't actually learn whether it's the not or the anod. It just learns sort of the way you constructed the data has some bias and it, so it's able to tell just because you constructed the data in a biased way to tell whether or not it's the not or the unknot, but it's not actually learning, learning it the thing you want it to learn. With this, we face a problem. There's no known way of writing down an unknot. So what we do in this case is we start on the empty braid word, which is the unknot or which represents the unknot, and then we use the braid relations and the Markov moves in order to obtain a braid word of length 12, 24, and so on, which then represents the unknot. So this sort of fixes, this problem here fixes how we go about of, of getting unknots of, of a fixed length. And then to get similar knots, which are similar in spirit, we start from a random non-empty braid word of length n smaller than n, and then use braid relations and Markov moves to make it up to length n. So in this case, sort of the seed or the, the core part of the knot is just the empty braid word because we wanted an unknot. In this case, it's just some braid word. And then we just obscure it using Markov moves and braid relations in order to make it look complicated. And then we compute the Alexander polynomial. We chose Alexander because it's fast to do, even for, for large braids, to check triviality and to, so to see whether our data is sort of sensitive. We sort out, after we have done this, we sort out and knots that are already simple to, to recognize as being the unknot. So if I look at this for five seconds or so, I can tell you this is the unknot. It looks kind of non trivial, but so if you see immediately, you could. You could conjugate to move sigma six to the end, then you can do a destabilization because it's of the largest thing. Or when you look at the braid, you can see that you can just sort of weave out this extra strand again. Then you obtain this. Now you have just two consecutive inverses, so you can remove that. These are not consecutive inverses, but they commute. Sigma one commutes with sigma three and sigma four, so I can remove that. And now I can sort of just do four more destabilizations and this thing goes to the unknot. This is too trivial. We can do this rather quickly, so we're not interested in the things that simplify that easily. So we throw them out. Another thing that is can be recognized trivial or rather fast is whether an unknot is actually the unbraid. So without using Markov moves, just using braid relations rather than whether the braid word is equivalent to an empty braid word. This has been solved by the this problem, and we also solved these out. Good. So then we have um, we have um, still 12K or almost 12K knots left, and we trained it with 90%, and then we tested in 10%. So what you see here is the result on 1,000 or so knots. And you see that in 95 to 98% of the cases, the reformer is able to predict whether a given rate corresponds to the unknot. First, we were a little bit puzzled when we saw this, because you see the longer the braid is, actually the better the network performs. We were, were expecting this to be the other way around. But sort of the reason is that this thing here, so if you have a thousand knots in here, knots and unknots, if you um, have 12 braid word of length 12, this means you have uh, 12,000 letters in there, whereas here you have uh, 48,000. So it has more chances to learn here than there. And sometimes it has more data in that, in that case. So what we then did in order to see whether that was the cause, we sort of divided the set of 24. We, instead of using a thousand, we just used 500. And, Sorry, for the trains that we use instead of 10,000, we use 5,000 and, and so on. We scaled it down such that the amount of braid generators was the same. And then we found this. So now they all perform as essentially around 95, 96%. And this, this difference has gone away. So what this teaches us is that the neural network sort of is learning from locally, from the semantics or from the different braid generators, whether or not it can annot it but we still don't know how it does it exactly. And this is always a very pressing question in machine learning, but what you can do, or what we did is we computed the Jones polynomial for the length 12 knots. There it's feasible to do it, it's still fast enough. And what we plotted here is the maximal absolute exponent in the Jones polynomial, or the difference of the maximum and the minimum exponent in the Jones polynomial versus the average prediction for how, how sure the neural network is that, it, that the braid corresponds to the R knot. It's the log of that. So point at one or log zero means that uh, 
it's uh, it's answered one. So it's very sure that this is the R naught, and indeed this color which uh, corresponds to the R naught. And then the higher the degrees in the Jones polynomial get, the uh, the surer the net neural network is that it is actually that is actually a, a non-trivial knot. So there's this log linear correspondence it seems, which really tells us uh, which really tells us that it seems they have learned something about using the Jones polynomial. I wouldn't say, claim it has learned the Jones polynomial, but it, there's this co linear correlation between these quantities, the non-triviality of the Jones polynomial and the prediction or how sure the neural network is. Okay, in my last three minutes or so, I want to talk about reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, we ask the harder question of whether, not just whether or not is, but how you would actually unknot it. So the physical actions you would have to perform in your knot in order to turn it into the unknot. So what we do is we put it in some input state. We let it propose a next action. So in this example, let's say we want to find a minimum here. So would the agent would propose one action. It would perform this action. And then we, re we reward it or we punish it based on what it did. So in this case, we want to find minimum. It went down, so it gets a reward. The thing sees, OK, it got a reward, so it adjusts its behavior. We take this as a new input state. It finds its next action. In this case, it took this one. It moved slightly up, so we punish it. It learns it adjusts its behavior and so on. So it goes on in order until it reaches the minimum it gets this big reward. And this is set up such that it maximizes its long-term return. So if you do this for the unknot, sometimes you might have to weave in some extra strand, make this not more complicated in order to get it to simplify. So this seems like the, the appropriate strategy to maximize the long-term return, not just sort of making it as simple as possible, but sort of optimizing it such that in the end, you'll really get to the unknot. So what are the actions? Well, by Markov's theorem, you can always um, use um, the regulations and Markov moves to transform to, to links into each other. But in practice, this introduces a lot of actions, especially if, if the braid length is long. So uh, what we do instead is we use some more high level combinations of braid relations, stabilizations, removing inverses, conjugations, and uh, commutations in order to to make this set of actions smaller, scale only linearly in n rather than n to the rather than four n or so. The re we reward it just based on um, the braid length. So we want to get to the unbraid, which is the unknot, so this has length zero. So we always punish it by, by the length of the braid word. So it wants to get to something of zero length as quickly as possible. In order to find the next action, we have two neural networks which sort of propose which of the action, which next action is the best one and what, how good overall the state it is in actually, so how likely this will, it is that this will eventually lead to the unknown. And then the terminal state we end, well, if the braid is empty, then for sure it has found the unknown or after 300 actions. Of course, sometimes the braid we, we gave, it, we fed the, into the neural network was not the unknown, then it cannot be an empty braid word. So then it will just sort of do something idle and in the end will have produced still the shortest representative or the simplest the simplest knot where simplicity is measured by the length of the braid word. We find that depending on n, it manages in around 70% or well, n72 a little bit less, 70 to 80%, it manages to actually find the moves that reduce the braid word to nothing. And um, this is compared to a random walker we, where we do not use a neural network, but just sort of let it randomly perform an action rather than training the neural network to do this. And we find that this drops, the accuracy drops down exponentially. So it has learned some strategy to, uh, to unknot a given knot. Okay, I'm, I'm running out of time, so let me conclude. It is not known whether a fast unknot algorithm exists, but um, it's important sort of in physics and mathematics biology to, to know whether some knotted structure is actually trivial. We phrase this decision problem of unknotting in terms of as a natural language process problem. And we use the very, very recent reformer in order to classify whether it's an unknot and we find this works very well. And we use reinforcement learning to solve the harder problem of actually performing actions that, that are not a given knot. And we found that it reaches 70 to 80% accuracy. 
So um, before I conclude, let me make a final announcement. Due to coronavirus, as many of you, of course, and this also happened to this conference, and some conference had to be canceled, some went virtual, and some are postponed. We had organized two, one at CERN and one in Bonn. They are postponed, so look out for that when we announce when they will be. And we have this continuation of the Physics Meets ML a meeting, which was done in Microsoft Research last year. And I will post the URL later, and we have a series of talks there every two weeks. We have a talk, and if you're interested, please, um, please go here and check it out. OK, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Fabian. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, I'll open it up to questions. Let me ask one very quick question. In your uh, reformer uh, on not recognition network, uh, how many layers did you use? And did you study the dependence on the number of layers? Yeah, so there are, um, there are many. There are many parameters in here. We played with the parameters um, for layers. We, we took 12 of these reformer modules. So we have this embedding, then the X embedding, and then 12 times this, and then one, one fully connected layer and the output. We didn't see whether already six are enough because it was, well, it's trainable on the GPU within a few hours, and um, results were 98%. So this was, this was good enough for us to not play too excessively with this. We want to use this reformer also as, as a neural network that pro proposes the next action uh, in, in, re in reinforcement learning. And then sort of we might want to make this simpler so we can train it faster. But for the, just for the decision problem, it was sort of using 12 layers, got very good results, and was still trainable. OK. And I'm curious, because there does seem to be some you know, Sequential, you know, you, you, uh, more complicated knives require more steps. And of course, your reinforcement learning architecture naturally does that, but it would seem like the decision network would need uh, more layers to deal with more complicated knives. I'm just curious at that situation. I mean, also the question we are answering is, of course, more complicated reinforcement right. learning. Right, yeah. And sort of, especially this attention mechanism helps if your action space gets large in reinforcement learning, this attention mechanism really helps to tell it what to focus right. on. Right, good. Uh, okay, uh, thanks, uh, Fernando. Question? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you, Fabian, for the nice talk. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning this connection that you know that between knot theory and, uh, and quivers. Could you expand on that? Yes. Yeah, it was in the very beginning. So, what they, what they just noticed, and there's a series of two papers by, uh, by Sukowski and collaborators and sort of what they noticed is that just sort of you have this dictionary between sort of the number of loops and uh, the, homologi the homological degree in, of a knot. So they have sort of this, this dictionary which you can just apply in order to compute sort of things on the quiver or things on the knots. And this map has been worked out by them for some cases for torus knots, for example, but not for others. And one thing we want to do is once we have a way of simplifying the knot as much as possible, you want to see whether we can learn this map also with machine learning. But this requires sort of having a simple or a short representation of a knot. This is why we started. We started with this problem first of finding something that looks as simple as possible in terms of a braid before we try to learn this, this map for other knots. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, maybe time for one more question. Anybody? Um, Okay, if, if not, uh, well, let's thank uh, Fabian for 